um, and then we'll spend some time working through a case study where we'll implement uh, what we've learned. We'll leave some time at the end for the audience to ask questions uh, before closing the workshop. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please note that this event is recorded and will be posted to YouTube. Um, the event has live captioning. So if you'd like to use that, um, you can do so with the uh, show subtitles function here and the Zoom controls. We wish to acknowledge the history of the lands on which we are each living. Canada is home to many different Indigenous peoples. And we ask that each of you take a moment to research, learn about, and reflect upon the Indigenous people whose land you are currently on. TSPN resides in the greater Toronto area, and we are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'll also just remind everyone that we have an, a strict uh, no harassment policy at our events. So I'll just get started here um, telling you a little more, a little bit more about TSPN. So TSPN is a student-run science policy group based out of the University of Toronto, and we aim to provide a platform for students and postdocs to learn more about and engage in science policy. TSPN is open to all disciplines and is inclusive of all areas of research. And we also work with the community to advocate for evidence-based policy and to promote discussion on the topic, uh, on the science behind key policies. So we do all of this through workshops like today, uh, talks, our panels and campaigns. So this workshop series is a science policy 101 series and it's designed to teach you about the basics of science policy and uh, also connect you with some experts working in this space. So to begin, we're gonna start with taking a look at these initial questions, starting with what is science policy? So this term science policy can be used to define um, different things. It can be used to describe the way science is governed and allocated resources. It can also be used to describe how policy is formed based on evidence from scientific research. In either case, um, it's this interface between science and policy that is incredibly important and really has a significant impact on the way society functions. So we're gonna to try to explain this term a bit more by touching on the second point here, um, which is where does science policy fit in with other forms of science translation or kind of other ways of moving from scientific research to application. So we've developed a map to help make sense of all the different ways that science can impact society and as we go through this next section, you can kind of be thinking about this last question here of where do I fit into this science translation or science policy space? So we'll start here. Uh, we at TSPN built this map, um, basically trying to break down how science occurs and how it gets used. So to start, we have this pathway going from scientific research that is conducted to its implementation. So to it being used um, in some form. Now, a few of the different, the main ways that this occurs are shown here. So at the top, we have scientific research being communicated to the scientific community and eventually contributing to this whole scientific body of knowledge. And the direct implementation of this can, can happen. So for example, if we think of uh, examples related to COVID, direct implementation of scientific knowledge might be clinicians using the continuously updating research on COVID to help treat their patients. As for the processes involved in this pathway, um, this may be familiar to many of you if you're a grad student or if you've been involved uh, in the academic world at all, but some of the, the ways that scientific research gets translated to the community, the scientific community is through scientific publications, um, science dissemination. So this can be kind of intentional ways of getting the information to peers such as conferences and uh, science education. Here we're thinking mostly of post-secondary education to, to people in the scientific community. Uh, and moving down this pathway to um, science translation to the public, we have scientific research being translated in the form of information, which then contributes to public knowledge or in the form of products and services, which is represented here as new technology. So looking first at that blue part, uh, the information piece, processes that may be involved here are science journalism, so like news, newspapers, documentaries, 
uh, science outreach. So promoting public awareness of science um, can be kind of efforts targeted to specific populations or focusing on specific topics uh, and science education. And here we're thinking a little bit more broadly about education. Um, the direct implementation of this then of public knowledge can be thinking of COVID again, um, how, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we didn't really know how COVID was getting around. Many people were doing things like disinfecting their groceries. Once we found out more about the science on the virus and how it's being transmitted, we could change our behavior, stop doing that and start doing things that are, you know, more useful ways of, of controlling it. Um, for moving further down, like I said, products and services are another way that the public can use scientific research. So some terms you may have heard um, that are involved in that process of taking research, uh, whether it be from universities, research institutions, or industry into new technology are product development and technology transfer. So an example of direct implementation resulting from this pathway would be something like uh, rapid antigen tests. So recently developed based on new research and now they're used every day to uh, help manage the pandemic. And this last line here is uh, science being communicated to policymakers to develop policy. And the processes that we have included here are science advice and science advocacy. So science advice is generally sought out advice um, from experts to advise on issues related to policy, whereas science advocacy kind of describes more of the push for evidence on specific topics to be used to inform policy. Um, and an example of direct implementation resulting from this pathway would be something like the mass mandates uh, that were put in place based on the evidence. So now in all of these cases, we've just tried to summarize it. There may be some other terms that you're more used to hearing in your own discipline, um, but we thought this was a, a summary of kind of what's involved. And importantly, in all of these four components of knowledge translation, we actually have this loop back um, of them informing what research is then conducted next. So what is known scientifically can kind of determine what questions we ask next or what the public's interested in may also contribute to what is studied. The technology, the tools that we have available define what research uh, can be done as well. And this last pathway here um, of how policy informs scientific research is of particular interest to us looking at uh, this science policy interface. And it's also what today's workshop is focused on. So breaking it down a little further, um, this is the pathway of policy for science. So policy can be directed towards the research or the researchers, um, but in either case, it does greatly influence the type, the amount, quality of, of research that's being conducted. So this brings me to um, these three specific areas that we wanted to focus on. Uh, we think these are really critical pathways uh, to understanding the science policy interface. So here they are laid out on their own. And these are the three um, pathways that are the focus of each of our workshops in this research at work, uh, research at work workshop series. So we're starting today uh, with workshop one, policy for science. Our second workshop is uh, focusing on that science in the public piece with science communication to the public. And then our final workshop um, focuses on the science for policy pathway. So just focusing on this topic today, policy for science, um, some important concepts that are involved are shown here. So principles like open science, scientific integrity are important for informing our research. Uh, funding, so whether it be funding of grants or funding of graduate students is also important in determining what kind of research can be done. And another concept that you'll hear about today is equity, diversity, and inclusion, and how um, consideration of EDI is really important to the world of science. And we also have graduate training included here as part of this pathway as well. So now that we've kind of oriented ourselves uh, to where policy for science fits into this science policy interface and more broadly to this whole science translation map, um, I'd like to now introduce our wonderful speakers that we have that will be talking about this in more depth. So we are very pleased to have with us today, uh, Dr. Masha Seema and Dr. Mary Rose Bradley-Gill. So Dr. Seema is a policy advisor to the Chief Science Advisor of Canada, Dr. Mona Niemer, and she works on open science and science advice in emergency preparedness. Prior to her current role, Masha completed a uh, MITAX Canadian Science Policy Fellowship at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, where she helped build a high containment laboratory network that fostered international cooperation, knowledge translation, and exchange to strengthen preparedness to high consequence pathogens. 
Masha entered her PhD in 2016 from the Department of Molecular Genetics at U of T, uh, during which she examined the role of autophagy machinery in host defense against bacterial pathogens. And Masha received her first exposure to policy in 2014 through a fellowship at the World Health Organization, uh, where she worked on antimicrobial resistance. And we also have Dr. Bradley Gill with us, and she's currently working as a senior program analyst on, uh, on the College and Community Innovation Program team at NSERC. And she started at NSERC in 2020, first as a MITAX Canadian Science Policy Fellow, analyzing self-identification data from NSERC programs. Previously, she received her PhD in biology from McGill, where she studied genes mutated in cancer and their role in the basic processes that control cell division and development. And during her graduate thesis, Mary Rose was co-president and served um, on the board of directors of Science and Policy Exchange, and she is passionate about relating research to the broader society and promoting evidence-based policy making. She has organized events such as policy discussions on gender barriers in science, a Wikipedia editing night to create and enhance pages of women scientists, and she ran a STEMinist book club discussing books related to underrepresented groups in science. So thank you both so much for joining us today. We are very grateful to have you here to discuss uh, the topic of policy for science and to share some of your experiences. So we're gonna start with those short talks from each speaker. So first I will pass it off to uh, Dr. Bradley Gill. Hi everyone. And uh, thanks for that presentation, Don. I really liked your diagram of all the, the research and policy um, diagram. And just before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm joining this meeting from Joe Jaga or Montreal. The Ganyakahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of this unceded and uncertain territory that has been historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations reaching back to time immemorial. And today it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. And uh, now I will share my screen. Just have a few slides. They're not that exciting, but just uh, to keep track of what I want to say. Okay, you see that? So as you can. Okay, so uh, Don gave my introductions. So I won't spend too long on that. Um, maybe so just a brief timeline before I go into some of these a bit more in detail. I completed my bachelor's at McGill in biology in 2011. Um, and then I did my PhD in the same program at McGill. I'm also from Montreal, so I just have never left. Uh, from in 2020, 2021, I held my MITAC Science Policy Fellowship at NSERC, and now I'm a senior program analyst uh, on a two-year contract uh, with NSERC as well. Um, so during my bachelor's, I did an honors research project in a research lab, and I stayed there for another like 10 years. Um, my PhD project was studying genes deregulated in cancer using the model organism, the fruit fly, and I will ha still have my like fruit fly mug here to represent that. And uh, But I also got really involved in different um, extracurriculars, like being involved in my graduate student organization, um, different women in science uh, organizations, and uh, most importantly to my future career decision was getting involved with Science and Policy Exchange, which some of you uh, may have heard about. Um, but just in case, I'll say that Science and Policy Exchange, or SPE, is a nonprofit run by uh, students and trainees. And looking to involve students in science policy and connect them with academics and government and industry on issues in science policy and doing both the aspects like was kind of covered of um, science for policy and also policy for science. Uh, so I began volunteering with them as VP external. I was co-president for half a year before taking a maternity leave and then I was on their board of directors uh, 2019, 2020, and uh, did a lot of things with them, but some of the things that have really stood out in my mind that led to what I want to do after was um, some things like working on this campaign that we had that was called Students for the Report, which was supporting a government commissioned um, report called the Fundamental Science Review, which investigated 
the state of fundamental science and recommended reinvestment into fundamental science in Canada. And we wrote a report from the student perspective promoting, um, uh, promoting investment into fundamental science, uh, which did result in budget 2019 having a historic investment in fundamental science. I also got to participate in submissions to the Standing Committee of Finance for budgets. So every year the federal government uh, in, asks for input into what's gonna be in the budget for next year and anyone or any group can, can put in a submission. So we also um, submitted um, some reports of things we wanted to see in the budget, like supporting uh, students and scholarships and fellowships and uh, ran a survey of graduate students and postdocs on funding for scholarships and fellowships. And I also got to attend the Canadian Science Policy Conference for a couple of years in person. And I was also on a panel shaping science policy to improve EDI. And I also participated in you know, some of the events that we had that was more science for policy, but um, you know, might notice or I'll tell you that a lot of the things that really stood out to me was the policy for science. Um, I became interested in how the, how, who gets to decide what science gets done and who gets to participate in science was kind of the questions I started to really get interested in. And uh, so at the, towards the end of my degree, I started looking for a job and I just wanted to give a bit of perspective of what my job search looked like. So I tried a few different avenues to get into policy for science. I applied directly to NSERC. I applied to the recruitment of policy leaders. Those both weren't successful, um, but I applied to the MyTech Science Policy Fellowship, although it took, it was my third try um, that I got it. Um, so just to say, you know, even if your first try doesn't work out, you can still, still get there eventually. Um, but I know also know people who got it on the first try, so I don't want to discourage you as well. Um, and just general networking and learning about science policy. I think Masha has a slide that has a lot of different opportunities to get involved, so I won't go into detail about that. But some things I did was a program called Science Outside the Lab North, which was like a week long science policy experience. I don't know what happened to it during COVID, so perhaps someone else can answer that question. But um, and then just general networking things like reaching out to people who I met at CSBC or on LinkedIn and also just the connections I made through SPE and also became active on Twitter, which I'm not really active anymore, but um, it definitely is a good way to stay in touch with things that are happening in science policy. And maybe just to mention some skills that I gained along the way that I think were important for finding my position um, where I am now. Uh, first was just so some of those general skills that you get during your PhD, like your strong researching abilities and being able to go through complex bodies of literature, um, being able to communicate science and especially to different kinds of audiences, um, like knowing when you're talking to a scientist versus uh, a policymaker or someone from the general public. Um, and then also just the like, general leadership and the volunteer work that I did. Um, but especially because my degree was not policy related in any way, um, definitely getting involved with SPE uh, was really important to gain some science policy experience. Um, and then also just, I think my interest and experience in EDI and the academics um, setting also helped me just kind of have an interest, a focused interest that set my CV apart. But I think this can look like various various things like if you're working in your your research is in something policy related if you have that focus that really kind of sets you apart I think that's just something um, something to keep in mind and then just a little bit about um, the my tax science policy fellowship I did um, so if you haven't heard of it um, it's a program run through my tax to match PhDs with hosting government offices. Um, if you get in, there, it also includes several courses throughout the year um, by my tax and things like Science Policy 101, writing briefing notes, communication skills, um, and things like that. And it also just connects you with a cohort of other fellowships. So like we have a Slack channel where we 
stay in touch and uh, also connected to previous fellows. So it, it's also this nice network of like-minded people. And so just my experience with it was uh, I was hosted by NSERC in the vice president's office uh, where I analyzed self-identification data of applicants across different NSERC programs. Um, and this was to look at whether what groups were underrepresented and the different ways we can start to address that. Um, and I just put a little note in case you're not familiar with Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council or NSERC. It's one of the three Canadian funding agencies, which are also called the Tri Agency for short. That also includes the Social Sciences and Humanities Council or SHRC and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research or CIHR. And NSERC specifically funds research uh, related to natural sciences and engineering as its name applies. Um, and it does this through diff several different kinds of programs like supporting uh, graduate students, postdocs, um, researchers themselves. And there's also a stream of partnership grants that for researchers who want to partner with industry um, and college level grants, which is the ones the, that I'm working in now. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention and it was really nicely laid out in that diagram, but uh, there is science that informs the policy for science as well. And uh, especially in the project that I was working on, um, this ends up, we're collecting evidence to inform the policy, um, but it's less, I guess it's more on the social sciences uh, type of, of evidence. And then just a little bit, of an overview of the EDI work at NSERC and all the tri-agencies as well. Um, just kind of as an example of policies for science. Uh, so it's based off the idea that, or we believe that uh, achieving a more equitable, diverse and inclusive Canadian research enterprise is essential to creating excellent, innovative and impactful research to respond to uh, local and global challenges. And so, with this in mind, um, this informed uh, that we committed to a tri-agency EDI action plan, which includes objectives to uh, fair access to tri-agency research and equitable participation in the research ecosystem. Um, there's a, a program called Dimensions, which is a pilot program to basically recognize the efforts of institutions in EDI um, and a charter that they can sign on to. And it also, uh, most grants now incorporate requirements into application criteria. So applicants need to explain how EDI is considered in their research, research teams, or training. And this is kind of an example of a policy tool or instrument we sometimes talk about. So how we can incentivize researchers to consider EDI um, because it's attached to their funding and their grants. And uh, I think I'm getting towards the end of my 10 minutes. So I'll just briefly say that I'm working on something similar in colleges where we're incorporating these kind of requirements into our college grants as well. And just some final thoughts is that, you know, if you're interested in science policy or policy for science, you know, don't be shy to get involved in any way you can. And also don't be afraid to reach out. Like I'm always willing to chat with people and everyone was always so willing to sit down and chat with me. So. Don't be afraid. I put my email up there or Frank or Don can give it out and I'm easy to find on LinkedIn as well. So thanks for listening, everyone. And I don't know if I pass. Stop sharing, first of all, and then pass it to Masha. Hi everyone, um, a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm calling in from Ottawa, which is uh, unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. So um, this is a great introduction. So I'm just gonna dive into the next slide. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about my own career journey as well as the topic of open science. And we're gonna uh, hand, um, look into a case study of open science later to kind of make it a little bit more tangible and give you a taste of what uh, this might mean 
uh, in action if you're a decision maker. So in terms of my career path, uh, I did my training at U of T uh, as a biochemistry specialist for my undergrad and then uh, in the Department of Molecular Genetics. Uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, I think um, kind of the the foray into policy for me was really the fellowship I did at the World Health Organization it was a very short fellowship, just three months, but it was um, a great eye opening experience for me. And uh, right after I finished um, graduate school, I, I wanted so I was at the WHO during Ebola outbreak and was very interested in the topic. And after I graduated, I really wanted to investigate outbreaks and I applied for a couple of fellowships fellowships in that area, but wasn't successful. But um, what I was successful was getting um, matched uh, to uh, a MyTax Canadian Science Policy Fellowship, but it was the first year uh, this fellowship was offered. So I was a part of inaugural cohort and was matched to Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after. Uh, I volunteered at the CSPC, Canadian Science Policy Conference, and highly recommend it uh, to either watch the videos from past conferences, to attend, or to volunteer. They're always looking for volunteers. Um, and, uh, and then uh, in, 2000, in January 2018, I joined the Office of the Chief Science Advisor uh, through the Recruitment of Policy Leaders Program. And I'm there ever since. Uh, so it's, and it's my team there in the photo of, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, next slide. So I just want to quickly talk about uh, my project for CFIA uh, at the CFIA because you know, as a graduate student, I when I got this email saying I've been matched to CFIA, I'm like, like why CFIA? Like it doesn't sound like there's exciting work going on. It's food safety. Um, originally, I thought maybe I was matched there because my uh, PhD work uh, was on Listeria and Salmonella and they saw some connections there, but no. Uh, I was matched there because there was a brand new uh, network of high containment laboratories. It was an international network, uh, five countries, both public health and animal health labs. And they just got a $2 million kind of grant from defense uh, to do this work and they needed somebody to manage uh, the secretariat, to manage all the working groups, et cetera. So, you know, this is something I didn't know existed and was totally lucky to match and had a great boss and had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are some of my memories from that year. Uh, on the left there is a photo of me in Winnipeg. Uh, it's a train, like this is, the photos in the training lab for biosafety level four and uh, a good I met lots of good friends there uh, and me trying on the biosafety level four suit suit, uh, suit yes uh, presenting a poster international conference with my boss uh, receiving an award at the CFIA and then on the right uh, is the science policy cohort and the network I have to say is still strong and played a big role in the during the COVID-19 in terms of uh, sharing samples uh, among the participating labs. So it's a great, great story. Next slide. And I thought I'm gonna just give some career advice here and then move on to open science um, side. So before I go there, uh, I wanted to highlight what I thought would is important to succeed uh, in science policy roles. And the first one is excellence. I mean, uh, everybody I worked four so far are PhDs, uh, even though I'm in government, and um, kind of looked at my track record during my PhD uh, when they were selected applicants. So just because you want to move away from research doesn't mean that what you have achieved in the lab or in, during your uh, training it, it doesn't matter. So um, I think excellence is a translatable skill. Uh, writing was really important and most of my work right now is actually writing, writing briefing notes, writing notes, writing speaking notes, all sorts of things, more so even than the presentations. Um, communicating science to everyone, uh, including the politicians. Um, I personally didn't communicate science to politicians, but it would be a good skill to have. Um, but yes, just talking to science, engaging with different audience and knowing how to engage different audience, like how to communicate, how to, what words you need to use, and that, that's important. Uh, in policy in general, you need to be aware of what's going on and how what you do fits in the larger larger scheme, so um, a larger picture. So reading the news, listening to the news, knowing what's going on everywhere else, it's, it's a skill. 
uh, it's important uh, and it's useful. Uh, interpersonal skills are important mostly because uh, there's a lot of um, like you need to work in teams with people from other departments. If you want to find out what's going on in an area, what's the latest, it's not like you go on PubMed and look up paper and policy. You have to call someone up. If something is published, it's old news already. You know, so if you want to know what's up and coming, it's really about cold calling, emailing, finding out who you need to talk to to, to learn that. And then investing in yourself. Um, I can talk more about it later, but Investing in your skills, it's something that I did during grad school and I'm doing now and often out of pocket. Um, at the time I was going to a bunch of global health conferences, um, just paying for it myself, staying at friends, couches, et cetera, um, taking courses uh, on all sorts of things like negotiations, um, taking auditing courses at U of T while I was still a student. Uh, English 101 actually was very helpful <laughs> for me. Um, since I'm, I, I'm an immigrant to Canada. So things like that, they're, they're quite helpful. Uh, next slide. So for this slide, I suggest you take a screenshot or a picture, or maybe the, uh, the organizers can uh, share this later. These are just some ideas on how to get involved. Uh, I think Mary Rose did a great job kind of describing it, um, big picture, but um, in getting involved in TSPN would be a great idea, volunteering at CSPC, Canadian Science Policy Conference, uh, doing one of those fellowships, um, participating in a youth advisory council. Um, those things are some things you can do if you want to get involved. Next slide. Okay, and so this is the second part of my talk uh, in January. Uh, 2018, I joined the Office of the Chief Science Advisor. Uh, the office itself and her, uh, um, the Chief Science Advisor was um, announced in the fall of 2017. Uh, so I joined just a couple of months after the office was created and it was still being built. Um, and that's, and I actually never heard uh, of the person uh, who was appointed to be the Chief Science Advisor before I started working there, but she has been such a role model and such an inspiration. And Dr. Mona Nevers, not only she's an excellent researcher and still runs an active lab, um, she's also just a very smart and kind and amazing human. So um, one of the key pieces of advice is really who you're working with. Um, I've been lucky uh, so far to work with great people and that's really, that matters a lot. So in her mandate, the first uh, line is really about ensuring public access to government science. And that's what open science work uh, that myself and my colleagues in the office are doing. Next slide. Uh, so what is open science? Um, uh, this, uh, I didn't create that. You know, there's lots of dimensions to open science. I think the most common ones that are mentioned are open access to publications, uh, open data, um, in open data, data management plans seems like a prerequisite kind of to having organized data that you can access, but there's a lot more. Um, and all of these are kind of dimensions uh, of the picture. Next slide. Canada is really lucky to have a number of leaders on open science. Uh, I'm gonna highlight here just one of them, uh, or maybe two, at uh, the Structural Genomic Consortium that's in Toronto, uh, in the Mars building. It's, uh, they've really been the leaders uh, in open science for the longest time. Uh, and really somebody, if you're interested uh, in open science practices, um, somewhere you can look uh, for inspiration. The neuro, um, which used to be the Montreal Neurological Institute in Montreal also has fantastic um, open science practices and expertise and a whole team that works on open science. They were the first open science institute in the world uh, and have a number of principles that everybody collectively agreed on um, and have great um, policies, but also infrastructure and buy-in. Um, and, and there's other players as well. Libraries, for example, are a big players, as well as enabling infrastructure. Next slide. Uh, these are just tri-agency policies. Um, I think the important one to note is they're an open access policy. 
Um, that's the same for all agencies. Uh, DORA is about uh, research assessment and recognizing open science practices uh, in research assessment. And then there's a new uh, data management policy uh, from the tri-agency, which um, is really not about open science, but it's about having a plan and having data on a repository, et cetera. So best practices on, in that area. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot, because I'm running out of time, I might take three extra minutes <laughs> to go through the deck. Um, there's a lot of international open science initiatives uh, in Europe, um, in Japan, uh, in other countries. Uh, you might have heard of Plan S, uh, which is a coalition of funders uh, that want immediate open access to publications. Um, but here I outlined just some, because in the interest of time, common elements uh, of open science uh, initiatives. And I think this is the slide that's maybe worth remembering or just jotting down for when you work on your case study. So the common elements uh, are often uh, open access to publications and now more and more immediate open access, not a one year embargo, uh, data management plans, uh, infrastructure for FAIR data. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And evaluation uh, of researchers. So a research assessment. So our, how are researchers evaluated? Are these practices recognized? Are open data practices recognized? Because they're very time consuming and you wanna be recognized for them. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, it, this looks quick, but it's actually quite a long slide because this is my journey uh, in the office of the chief science advisor working on the open science um, on, on the open science front. So when I just joined in 2018, um, we knew that we wanted to do something, but it was kind of early days. So what I did at the time was trying to meet as many people as I could. So I had meetings with people in government, in the tri council, in the university sector. Uh, in international organizations, in um, offices of, like my, like ours, like the chief science advisor of UK, New Zealand, Australia, kind of learning uh, what they're doing in the US Office of Science and Technology Policy, et cetera, and just kind of getting the landscape, understanding what's going on. I call that environmental scan. Then, then we, came up, we came up with a plan and uh, decided that uh, we need to create a roadmap for open science. Actually, it's something I work with every day now because I, I am working on open science. So it's now published. So this is, this is the roadmap that our office has produced. But before we produced it, we had um, convened a committee, uh, advisory committee of experts, uh, both from university sector and from government sector. And they advised us on principles, um, and on vision uh, and on the recommendations. So the roadmap uh, was released by Minister Baines in 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, I worked on COVID-19 for quite a bit then and went on parental leave. Um, the office still kept going and uh, doing important work. And now upon return from parental leave around six months ago, uh, I was in charge of conducting consultation, open science dialogues with uh, some of the Canadian researchers to get their perspective. What are the gaps? What are the needs? What are their sentiments? Um, and people who were involved were just stellar scientists, not those who particularly um, open science advocates or not, but you know, just everyone. Uh, and uh, we produced that um, summary. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the high picture of what happened uh, on open science um, in my, from my perspective, from my role. Next slide. And I think I just want to conclude on that. Uh, this is the quote from my boss at an open science um, event that was organized by Montreal Neurological Institute a couple of years ago. Open science is more than making scientific products available. It's a way of thinking about and doing science. It's about transparency, sharing, and accelerating the pace of discovery. By embracing open science, Canada can lead the way to a more collaborative and productive future. Thank you. And with that, uh, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Seema and to Dr. Bradley Gill for those really excellent introductions to their, uh, their paths in policy for science and these key topics 
uh, of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, and policy and, uh, and, and open science policy. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, we're going to transition now into uh, a, a relatively brief um, mini panel where we have a few questions where we can sort of dive a little deeper into these key topics of EDI and science and uh, open science as well. Uh, so I'll just open up my notes. I had to close them for the screen share. Thank you for doing that for me. No worries. And so there won't be any audience questions for this part. Um, but if you have any questions about your career paths, feel free to put that in the chat and maybe we'll address it later on. All right, so the first question we have for, for both of you um, is a question about how your perspectives have changed. So obviously both of you started um, you know, engaging very directly in science as graduate students and are now have more policy and policy oriented careers. Uh, so we were wondering about how your perspectives about science have changed in this transition. So we could perhaps start with Dr. Simo. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I think that um, I would say that you definitely get a broader view from uh, this side uh, because you're thinking about um, you're thinking about the whole system often. Uh, you think about, so when we think about open science, we're thinking about what it means for researchers, but also what it means for the libraries and the universities and even the publishers and the publishing side and what it would be a sustainable way uh, to transition the system towards more open, open science approach. So I think, you know, I haven't really change my perspective necessarily on things that were in my domain, but it just grew and expanded uh, in this in this period time period. Mary Rose. Yeah, I think very similar idea of going from something really focused to more bigger picture. And I think also just the perspective that, you know, maybe this was a bit more naive or just from my like science bias but just thinking that you know the evidence and the science is like absolute fact and you know there's there's the fact and fact and opinions but I think what I've come to appreciate is even what science gets done and how you interpret it is um, impacted by our own biases and experiences so I think just having that bigger picture perspective let me see that uh, a bit more. Yeah, I just want to build on that. It's true that you're moving from more of this black and white world to the gray world. And uh, it's, it's really like that. Um, yeah, perhaps you will see when you do the case study. <laughs> That's it, thank you. <laughs> no, excellent, excellent. Um, so transitioning a little into some of the key themes, I guess, that we've started to, to touch on, um, one of which we didn't perhaps touch on in, in great depth, but obviously uh, very central to this question of policy for science is these questions about uh, funding and about the Tri-Council and about how the Tri-Council sort of engages with government in a broader sense. Um, so we have this question, you know, for both of you, if either if you want to pick it up, uh, how does the Tri-Council, the Tri-Agency, engage with the broader machinery of government? Since it, it obviously sort of the agencies exist as distinct, how does it engage with the broader machinery of government? Yeah. I do. If you want, I can do a more picture. So just a disclaimer, you know, like when we're PhDs, we just say talk about things that we know for sure. Now we're more kind of, you know, we know a little bit, but we're not really in there. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, in general, how policy is structured is um, you have, even though uh, tri agencies are not part of the core government departments, they're still part of that landscape. So the way it works is you have central agencies, which are private privy council office, treasury board, and ministry of finance, and they just set the agenda kind of for the government. And so they're the one who write Ministry of Finance writes the budget, etc. And uh, the Tri Council get their funding through that route. So basically, um, and you know, if we even look in a little bit more deeper, then uh, the SHRC and NSERC are uh, kind of under Innovation Science and Economic Development and reporting to Minister of uh, Minister Champagne, Minister of 
Science, Innovation, and Economic Development, and CIHR is reporting to the Minister of Health. Uh, but they're kind, of, they're kind of all connected and they all talk to one another. So uh, in order for the granting council, for example, to get more money, they need to, usually they would submit um, kind of a proposal to the central agencies through their different routes, and they would review them and approve or deny. And so that's kind of how it works. Uh, they, all, all the agencies also have their governing council. So somebody kind of oversees the strategic um, strategic directions of these organizations. And there's a lot of esteemed uh, professors who sit on these boards. Um, so that's kind of like the very big picture. And a lot of the government departments work in a similar way. Um, so, but then the, uh, the ministers, what they care about is also the stakeholder reaction. So uh, some, there's uh, staff in the minister's office and they engaged sometimes directly with universities or with the researchers and they kind of think about you know how it all like what kind of reactions they would get from the researchers from the um administrators uh from their constituents etc uh when making decisions uh so it's just a high level uh picture and i, I wonder if mary rose wants to add uh to this yeah i think that was a complete overview maybe just to give an example of yeah, so NSERC sits under the office of the sort of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, or ISED. And so we do have a lot of back and forth where sometimes they're coming to us with priorities that we need to go then carry out. But we also can talk back to them and say, like, this is what the community is asking for. This is what we think is a good next step. Um, so there's a bit of back and forth. Um, but sometimes, you know, it comes from the budget, like in 2020, 2021, like, specific money got put towards colleges for COVID recovery. So then we had to kind of really quickly develop this new grant because they asked us to. So it's uh, there's just a bit of back and forth there. And also just maybe mention we're starting to get more engaged at NSERC with um, the new parliamentary committee on science. I don't think that's the exact name, but so just like starting to engage directly. Sorry? SRSR, science yeah. and research, and both in French and English, that's why there's four letters. Yeah, so getting directly engaged instead of with like the ministers and the public service uh, ministers themselves, like getting directly involved with all the parliamentarians. So I think that's interesting. Yes, it's very connected. And I like what Mary Rose said about, you know, like the granting council suggests their priorities, but then also priorities were put forward from the other parts of the government on them. Okay, no, excellent. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess we'll transition into maybe one question about EDI and one about open science, uh, just in the interest of time to move towards that case study. Um, so I'll start with a question for, uh, for Dr. Bradley Gill about uh, EDI and science. Um, so a bit of a big question. Uh, there's obviously a need, when we talk about EDI, there's a need to advance EDI at many, many different layers, many, many different levels of science uh, relating to personnel, relating to the science itself, the science that's being performed and how we incorporate these considerations into that. Um, so you can go everything from supporting early career researchers uh, from underrepresented backgrounds to uh, creating opportunities for diverse populations of students to incorporating gender and sex in, uh, uh, in, in, in scientific research design and so on. Um, so I guess the question is, how do we prioritize these different needs? Um, is there a level at which uh, intervention might have sort of the greatest impact uh, how how are these kinds of things measured? Yeah, that is a really big question. And and I mean, I think our goal is to do a lot of different things at once, like targeting those different areas at once, um, because not one alone won't um, change the system because of what we ultimately need is a culture change. Um, but I think we do have some work prioritizing, like we first decided to make the action plan to kind of direct what we're going to do and thinking about specifically in grants or even like taking a small example on our college team we decided to start with asking researchers how they incorporate EDI into building their research teams and research training just because it was something more tangible that they could do um, where we thought they'd be more able to do um, whereas like they're very um, a lot of the research we find is very like industry and applied science so it's sometimes less obvious how they incorporate um, EDI or gender or sex into their research design. So I think our strategy was starting with 
bringing people along slowly so they understand why we're doing it and and with actions that they can slowly wrap their minds around. So I don't know if that fully answered your question, but just, yeah, we just need to be working from different angles and trying to get people on board to get that culture change is the approach we're taking. And you also kind of finish that question with ways to measure those impacts. And that's also questions we talk about constantly because there's the one aspect of just, you know, the representation and getting people, different groups better represented in our funding programs and just in research in general. Um, but that's something, that's only one aspect of it. And I think it will involve more like talking and surveying people to see um, if there is that culture change. And uh, yeah, we're still, <laughs> we're still working on those in, um, objectives, um, but there are also some lined out in our tri-agency uh, EDI action plan too, if you want further details. Right now it's looking more like year over year improvement and different things. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a long, long term goals. I mean, these are, these are massive institutions yeah. all over the country. And this is, as you say, a culture change. So it makes a lot of sense, but uh, interesting to hear about how uh, the different angles at which this is approached and uh, uh, the the way that this, these aspects are sort of measured, these competing perspectives as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so I'll just ask a question to, to Dr. Seema about open science um, and sort of ask a little bit about how the federal government or, or whether the federal government has a role to play in promoting open science and scientific integrity outside of government and how perhaps the federal government might incentivize open science uh, when obviously directly it can only impact government science. Yeah, I well, just first point, I wanted to say that culture change, I think, is important for both open science and EDI, and you just kind of change the way you do things. And then the second point I wanted to say is, you know, even your questions to Mary Rose is like you have to see what's within your scope, like what do you have policy cover to do? And sometimes when you're outside the government, you don't necessarily see that everybody has their own kind of limits. You're playing within your lanes or different expressions for to explain that. But yeah, what is the zone of what is the what do you have the policy cover over? And then what do you have the influence over? Maybe you don't have direct cover uh, to do this work, but you can engage, promote, celebrate, you know, somehow influence, shame, like you know, people into doing certain things. So um, I think the ideal, um, in the ideal world, Canada would have the same open science policies and practices, both in government and outside government. Right now is not the case. Right now, a agency has their policy and then federal government is doing their own thing. Um, and we're really hoping that things will <laughs> come to one place um, eventually uh, with a lot of influence and leadership from different champions. So, um, so in terms of federal government, uh, I was surprised to learn that federal government does fund uh, a lot of research uh, in the university sector. Um, so departments like Environment Canada and NRCAN are funding research in, you know, in the areas of interest, like they're funding the university researchers. So if these grants would have a requirement uh, to, you know, make sure the outputs are open uh, when appropriate, then that would be a big win. Uh, leading, you know, or being, having leadership role, just doing the work themselves, kind of, you know, leading by example would be the other thing. And, and then just having more cohesion, you know, as I mentioned, having the same sets of rules, but um, it's, it, it's hard to get there uh, right now, but that's something we aspire to. I mean, these are all very aspirational, big, big, uh, meaty topics that we're, that we're touching on today. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I will move to the sort of final question and just ask both of you, sorry, I think I got a little notification, ask both of you um, if you could, in very brief, uh, answer this question. Uh, we're talking about big topics, we're talking about big things, uh, we're talking about big challenges in policy for science. Um, so we have sort of a little bit of a fun question where we ask, uh, if you were given $50 million from the next budget, um, where would you invest it in the Canadian scientific ecosystem 
uh, to have sort of the greatest impact on policy for science in Canada today. So perhaps we can start with uh, with Dr. Sima. Well, I just want to say that I think all the participants should ask themselves this question uh, and then ask themselves the question, if you do that, where would you take the money away from? <laughs> you know, because that's the reality of um, decision making. Uh, and that's the type of question you can really get on in an interview, um, especially if you go for an RPL interview. So, yeah. Uh, in terms of my answer, and I'm sure Mary Rose would agree with this, is uh, first priority would be really to increase the funding to the students and the trainees, um, because, um, yeah, it's been a long time without any increase, uh, and we need to support the, the young generation and the talent. And then, you know, next piece would be uh, certain trainings that would be helpful uh, for the up and coming researchers, you know, to um, for those who want to do excellent research, do excellent research, uh, but also know more about science communication, you know, all the things that um, make them more effective, really, at um, communicating their science, but also influencing decision and being kind of understanding kind of the big picture as well. Uh, and then I personally have passion for pandemic preparedness. So I would definitely dedicate some funding, <laughs> some funding to this topic, uh, given COVID, uh, you know, has been um, really at the forefront of everybody's mind for a while. And there, you know, I think I would invest in like anthropology and social science research and how to change people's behavior and how to um, engage people in the right way. Um, uh, I think that will also be very useful for climate change adaptation and, um, you know, because we would have to change behaviors as, um, you know, the future com comes and we're experiencing um, the, the consequences. So that would be it for me. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a really hard question and I wasn't really looking forward to answering it, but I think Masha touched on so many good points. And I think just from an EDI perspective, yeah, like funding students, like getting more students who can participate because um, with more funding for students and um, definitely money towards EDI initiatives would be important to me, just getting either like specific hiring from equity deserving groups and just it does require money to create that change and making sure the institutions are accessible um, and hiring experts and social science and black studies and all those different things to to be the ones driving that change and funding like the grassroots organizations I think that are driving those changes as well um, but yeah also everything Masha said <laughs> That's a very hard question, you know, and I do encourage everybody to think about it uh, and to have a couple of different answers. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you very much for both of you two for, for answering that tricky little question and, and, and thank you for all the excellent insights that you 